Hi, everybody. Happy Band Book Week. <laughs> you can't see us. We have noisemakers and hats on. No, seriously. Uh, we do celebrate Band Books Week uh, wholeheartedly here in the Library Science Department. We've been sharing um, all kinds of information about censorship uh, with our students and as well as with one another. And we'll probably talk about it a little bit at the faculty meeting today. So we thought this might be a good time to talk to you about Banned Books Week and about selection and censorship and challenges and gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. I think that's everything, right, Karen? I think so. Oh, and some copyright. Did you mention that? So yeah. No, I didn't. Probably did. And plagiarism. So mm -hmm. woohoo. Okay. Oh. So. Um, we're, 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 you know, there we go. as always, it's like a new day for us with the yeah, computer. Yeah, trying to grab know. things. Yeah. So uh, welcome to a PPBD production. I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. we're, we're like a little movie studio. That's right. Um, and uh, just in case you don't uh, know, because you haven't been watching us on YouTube before then, uh, we do have a YouTube channel. There is the bit.ly uh, URL to get there. And we try every week to post a new video. Sometimes it's book talks. Sometimes it's some aspect of librarianship. Uh, sometimes we do it together, sometimes we do it separately, mm -hmm. but pretty much we've been able to keep on schedule. I'm proud of us. Yes, I am too. <laughs> All right, so as you can see here, well, you know, and censorship is, it comes in all different shapes and forms and there's all different kinds. Um, but it's very important for you to know that very first bullet there, for every challenge reported, there are so many that go unreported. Because it does take an extra step for people to let ALA know that something's, you know, been challenged or reported. So just think about how many that are not being talked about. Um, not everything gets the huge outpouring of public response that some of these challenges get, you know, that you see on the news and everything. Some people won't report it because they're afraid of the bad publicity. And we right. all, I think, know circumstances like that. Yeah. And so it's important to keep that first bullet in mind. When you look at the number of challenges over the last five years, it appears as though we have fewer and fewer challenges, and that's not true. What's happening is the reporting is not happening. That's right. Uh, now, you can see that most two-thirds of the challenges originate in schools or school libraries, and we have a nice chart coming up later that will show you kind of who are doing these, and you'll see that um, why school libraries and schools are the biggest place for these to originate. Um, almost a third are because of sexually explicit materials, they don't want them to, oh, they don't want to read about sex. Uh, and 25% objected for offensive language. Good grief. And see, these are the things that I want to just smack my head because what do these kids listen to on regular TV nowadays? And in the hallways and on the school bus, these kids talk rougher than I do. And they worry about what they're going to read in a book. When I was uh, working with middle school kids, um, I would always have them fill out an index card that will show you back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth. We still <laughs> used index cards. Uh, but I would have them fill out index cards and list the television shows and movies that they have seen that their parents were aware of. Because I do know kids can sneak. Right. But I, I wanted to know. And if a parent back in, and we're talking about back in the 80s and 90s, if parents were letting uh, their kids watch Friends, there was nothing in a book that was going to be upsetting to them. Right. And I think today, oh my goodness, with cable, I don't I don't think anything could possibly be offensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My I, my, my, my parents wouldn't let me watch Three's Company. I didn't let my kids watch Friends until they were yeah. older. Uh, yeah, because there's, you know. Men and women should not be living together. That's right. They're married. <gasps> um, there was a lot of things there. I know it. Okay, so, and one in five challenges are because material is unsuited to age group. Now, I will say, there is a case that when that happens, Sometimes a parent or teacher or administrator comes to you and shows you something that's in your library and you research and you look and you say, oh, this clearly is for an older age group. So what do you do as an elementary librarian and somebody comes in and gives you Judy Blooms forever? Whoops, that really does not belong in an elementary school because of an age group. What do you do? You don't flip out and ban it. You ship it off to the high school. That's, right. that's all you do. 
when uh, Natalie was in elementary school, that's my nurse girl is how I refer to her on my blog, but she's my youngest. When she was in elementary school in uh, third grade, she brought home a copy of Tangerine mm. by Edward Bluer because it was in her ZPD. <laughs> uh, by the way, a lot, a lot, yeah. a lot of challenges here in Texas have been due to kids getting hold of books through AR yeah. that are unsuitable for their age group. But anyhow, she brought it home and everybody else in the house had read it. She has two older sisters and moi, of course. And we all said, you're not going to enjoy this book. We did not, by the way, ban her from reading it. She started reading it. She gave up very quickly. She said it was stupid, which mm -hmm. means I'm not ready for it mm -hmm. yet. And so I sent it to the school with a note inside asking the librarian to please send it on to the junior high and um, gave her a little bit of a, an idea about what was in the book. And she had simply ordered it because it was in the right ZPD mm -hmm. for some of the kids in class. So mm -hmm. Sometimes right. the challenge, and in my case, it was a, it wasn't even a challenge. I just asked her to please move the book on. It was education. Uh, it was because Natalie was not quite ready to read mm -hmm. a book like that. So here are the charts uh, that come from ALA, and I always find them absolutely uh, instructive. The purple bars are from the decade of the 90s and the blue bars are from the decade of the, the first decade of the 2000s. And so you can see the spikes here. The spikes are for offensive language, which we've already seen. The spikes are for sexually explicit material, for uh, unsuited to age group, for the other, which is always kind of fun. And notice that there are a couple smaller spikes here for violence and homosexuality. And Satanism. And, sa and religious viewpoints is, I'd say, a little bit of a right. spike. So, yeah. So if you're looking for good resources, we're going to give you the links to these, and they are live links when you um, look. Oh, no, they won't be live. We'll try to put those in the comments. We're really sorry. Yeah. I forgot about that. It can't be a live link on YouTube. Anyhow, we are giving you links to these charts so you can see them. So here's where I was going to say you can see why schools are um, a big origination place for challenges because our largest initiator of challenges is a parent um, by far, very clearly. Administrator, sometimes. Um, patron would imply public such a, a public sector um, and then of course we've got the other category other. <laughs> you know I don't know other what would fit in there but mm -hmm. the parent by far is the one that challenges the most and you can see that um, the number of parent challenges has declined from the 1990s into the 21st century. And I don't really have a clue as to why, but if you look, it's because there's been an uptick in that other category. So who in the world knows what and other is? And it all goes back to what's reported mm -hmm. there again. Exactly. And mm -hmm. here are challenges by institution. And you can see there it's just not even close that school and school library have the most challenges, followed by public library and then other. Mm -hmm. uh, again, that, that wonderful other, that you don't see this happening in a lot of places um, or it's just not reported. So one of the reasons why we're particularly um, committed to talking about this subject in our school library preparation program is because it's going to impact at some point the school or the school library. And most of us know of circumstances and one of us has even been involved in a circumstance yes. which she is going to talk about during this um, presentation. So the best defense is a strong offense. Offense. Now we've heard this phrase and it, and it applies in many situations but in this case it means be prepared just in case something does happen. And I would say you know, all of these are three little bullets are extremely important. Have a rationale for reading in general Definitely get the community on board with the freedom to read, the, re the, the Reader's Bill of Rights, all of that. But then the third one is so, so important. Have, use, and know your policies in place for handling challenges. If your school district does not have a policy in place for selection and reconsideration, you need to get that in place ASAP. That is the policy that tells you how you go about ordering your materials, what should be included in your collection, but then it also, a part of that is the reconsideration part, which includes the form that people need to fill out if they, com if they have a, ch um, a, a complaint, a challenge, yeah. whatever. Um, and it gives the policy and the procedure for what to do when that happens. Because once the person turns in the form, 
It's not just one person's opinion what happens to that book. You form a committee. People have to read it. People have to talk about it. You have a meeting and so on. So you need a policy in place. If you don't know if it has is in place in your district, go find that out right now. That's your assignment for this week. <laughs> what I love is that Ken Donaldson was writing about this topic. Actually, the article is called What to Do Before the Censor Comes. He was writing about this topic uh, 40 years ago mm -hmm. in English Journal. And I encourage you to go and look at that article. It is one that I refer to over and over again. I actually have a hard copy of it because I don't know that we could find one online mm -hmm. after 40 years. So it's not just librarians. It's also teachers. Right. And hopefully in a cooperative manner we're working because on Because classroom libraries definitely fall victim to challenges as well. Mm -hmm. And that classroom library falls under the same policy in your district as the school library does. Mm -hmm. So here are some of the resources we've already talked about. And while you won't be able to do a live link, you can actually type these phrases yeah. into Google and they, they will take you directly to what you need to know. Uh, the first is Banned Books Week information from the American Library Association, especially from its Office of Intellectual Freedom. They have a huge portion of the ALA ALA website dedicated to Ban Books Week that contain a lot of the information we're sharing here and so much more. We've talked about having a rationale in place for reading in general, but also a rationale in place if you're going to teach commonly challenged materials or if you're going to add them to the collection. What are the commonly challenged materials? We're getting to that. Uh, but if you want to write a rationale and have it in place as to why you have this book, NCTE and ALA both have wonderful guidelines for writing rationales for the chocolate war or looking for Alaska or Antango makes three, uh, pick your poison here. Now, years ago, they had available, I think it was ALA or was it NCTE? It's NCTE. Had the CDs? Yes. Yeah, they had some, they had two, two volumes that I have of CDs that um, are rationales already written up for you for these commonly challenged books. And they come off as like Word documents that mm -hmm. you can then use. So you can definitely go out and find these resources. I'm sure they still have them available. They still have them available yeah. and they're digitized now, there you which go. means Yay, you don't even better. have to download them <laughs> or, or don't have to buy the CD. Right. That's good. Uh, that, you know, again, we go back a ways. But then that's your example. Mm -hmm. You go and create your own. Your own. Although if they have them already for a book you're using, let's say The Chocolate War, then you've got that. You That's can just right. read through that exactly. and understand that there's your rationale. Exactly. Sometimes I just want to rewrite it just to kind of put in my mind the reason why mm -hmm. I'm including this book. Uh, the final resource is uh, the policy that Karen talked about, that reconsideration of materials policy. When someone seeks to challenge or ban a book, there should be a policy in place, the form should be readily accessible, and you should follow the policy. The problem is that often that policy is not followed. That's right. People will um, go up in arms, they will, they will be either incensed or they will, out of fear, the, the administration will get a complaint from a parent and they'll automatically just freak out and they'll come to the library and they'll want to start pulling books off the shelf. Well, that's a no-no. They need to follow the policy. Put the link there. Yeah, there's a link um, here to the YouTube video, which is a, a video I put together on ethics and censorship, and uh, I think Karen uses it as well, in the Young Adult Literature course, because we want librarians to understand that not only is censorship wrong, uh, but that it's an ethical issue that we all have to deal with at some point. So we talk about the ethics of challenging books, banning books, self-censorship, gatekeeping, some of the other topics that we're going to talk about uh, during this broadcast. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit, we're just going to touch on copyright a little bit. You know, there are different types and levels of, um, I guess, things that are out there that's available mm -hmm. for your use. So traditional copyright, of course, is work cannot be used or adapted or copied at all without permission. Um, and so that's like the highest level. But then now we also have Creative Commons, and that is, you know, it's a little bit um, more of a flexibility there because it tells you things that you can do with it. And like in Google, you can search in images by these levels of, of, um, of use and, and uh, restrictions. So you can look for things that are licensed in Creative Commons that allow you to use it if it's for nonprofit 
or they allow you to use it with with modifications and so you need to be t pay attention to what you are allowed to do with the resources that you're you're uh, choosing to include in anything that you're working on of course the safe thing is you always need to give credit where credit is due you know you did not create this image don't act like you did um, and of course then we have public domain which means you can use it adapt it without restrictions no permission needed but the thing is most things public domain aren't necessarily things that we're want, wanting to use right now so you can see that it's works prior to 1923 and so it's people that have long been gone and you know and don't have estates that you exactly. have to pay royalties to uh, it's probably what's in most of the literature textbooks around uh, I'm glad that Karen said make sure that you give credit proper attribution for any and all of these is really essential um, Karen and I make our videos available and you can certainly share them with others give people the link we make a lot of our presentations available on SlideShare. Um, we put documents up there as well. Uh, we give links to Google Docs. But we're hoping that when we see these things shared, that they're shared with some credit uh, to what it is that we're doing. Uh, and if you're, you know, removing the attribution, that's not a very nice thing, and you're violating copyright. That's unethical. So uh, I, I included this one here because uh, this was a, a question that I got a lot. Um, we don't really use a lot of CDs and DVDs and VCRs and those kind of things now, but it is illegal to copy them into another format. Mm -hmm. It is illegal um, to copy a CD or DVD that you've bought to a computer for your own use. It's illegal uh, to, again, m put it on a different device. It's illegal to record a TV program, and you can see the British spelling there, so you know where this comes from, uh, to watch at a later time. It's, that's legal. I'm sorry, I said illegal. It is legal. I'm sorry. Um, and we all do that. Uh, we all do DVRs and stuff like that. I know a lot of people DVR the debate last night mm -hmm. so that they could watch it today. Uh, maybe not screaming at the set. But you know time. what? Even that has some stipulations. It does. Recording the debate last night to use in your classroom, that's totally okay. However, it's okay if you show it within the first 10 days you recorded mm -hmm. it and it's no longer used 45 days later. You know, there are stipulations in Absolutely. what you can do with these things that you record. You can't just record it and use it forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And we, we know, I know, how teachers are. We tend to want to use do. things Good grief. forever and ever and I've ever and ever. I've had people that have taken care of these VCR tapes that they had these things that they showed every year. And it's like, oh, my God, when this goes, I'm going to be in trouble. It's like, well, you shouldn't have been using it anyway. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe we can talk about something legal you can do. Yeah. Um, we also included in here not just copyright, but this concept of plagiarism because in this Wikipedia age, mm -hmm. um, kids don't necessarily understand. No, when copy and paste is so easy, oh my goodness. So I think it's a good idea to talk to kids about this. I love the Venn diagram. Uh, plagiarism is when you don't say where you took it, uh, and copyright when you take it without permission. And sometimes there's an overlap when you take it without permission and pass it off as your own work. We uh, unfortunately have seen some of that even in our jobs, mm -hmm. uh, which is why we have things like turnitin.com uh, so that we can run something through a program and see whether or not it's original work. Um, the kids used to say, how do you know I copied from the encyclopedia? Well, you know, I told them it's because I'd memorized every single volume in the Encyclopedia Britannica, but it was because nobody writes like the Encyclopedia Britannica does. And, of course, when kids copy and paste, they'll sometimes change one word and they won't do it right. Uh, so, you know, we get them. But I think we need to talk to kids about why this is illegal and why it is unethical as well. So, and you see it in the in the in the book community as well. Mm -hmm. Every once in a while, it'll come up and say, you know, that people are, you know, there was a woman that was challenging J.K. Rowling for a while, saying that she took her idea for Harry Potter, um, that it was too close to her mm -hmm. idea, you know. And um, there was another one where the book actually was pulled, and it, uh, it's so hard for me to remember that name, but it was based. It was complained that they copied too much of Megan McCafferty's. Um, Sloppy first, Sloppy first was the book that was copied, and the other girl, um, they pulled her book and did not, I mean, she was a young college girl, 
big, you know, like up and comer and big like couple book deal and they pulled it right away. So we do see it in our industry mm -hmm. as well. Uh, when we talk about classics, I, th I sometimes think people say, well, you know, I teach the literary canon. Well, here are 10 works from the literary canon from ALA that also get challenged. Often they're always on that mm -hmm. top. So many of these are on the top 10 bit list every year. And of course, I've read all 10 uh, mm -hmm. as an adult, but I, I don't think... Um, having read Beloved by Toni Morrison as an adult, I don't know that it would have really had the impact on me that it did when I read it as an adult. And when you look at some of the topics for some of these classic, classic stories, you can understand why they get challenged. And again, it's probably being used with an audience for whom it's not necessarily the intended audience. So we want you to understand that classics get challenged, but so do books for children. Oh my goodness. So the stupids, and of course, you know, you can just imagine, you know, the stupids, they're called the stupids. First of all, some people probably very simply hate the word stupid, mm -hmm. and that's, that's right. another thing, you know, and so, but then are you there, God, it's me, Margaret. She's talking about going through puberty, mm -hmm. you know, and so that people don't like, you know, that. I mean, there's just so many young books, Judy B. Jones. Mm -hmm. They complain that Junie B. Jones uses um, incorrect spelling, spelling, you know, unconventional spelling, where it's authentically that kindergarten student kind of spelling. People had a problem with it, feeling like it was going to be teaching students, mm -hmm. teaching kids to do it and spell wrong. The Wish Giver was the winner of the Texas Blue Bonnet Award the year that it was on the list, and yet notice that it's on the top challenge books for kids and you know because the basically it's a monkey's paw for kids be careful what you wish for mm -hmm. it might come true i adored that book but because of some of the pieces of it uh it's been roundly challenged even here in texas where it won the blue bonnet award and captain underpants always on that top 10 or you know always in there somewhere every and year we all know why we but honest it. to pete that's why we love the that's book right. so much and of course we know uh, being YA people, that young adult challenge, challenges are many, 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 many. So here are uh, basically books from the top, I think these are the top 25 okay. of all-time challenge books. And um, Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian by Sherman Alexie. I remember watching him read that at the Texas Book Festival, and he read uh, the piece in it about boners uh -huh. and they're having this discussion about awesome. boners. Everyone in the audience is falling on the floor mm -hmm. laughing just in paroxysms of laughter. Mm -hmm. And yet that's the thing that people are going to object to. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, and then of course speak uh, forever for a sexual experience, um, hunger games, the violence, mm -hmm. uh, the chocolate war also the violence. Lots of violence. Yeah. The fault, fault in our stars. In our stars. Uh, I don't know. Sexual experience. It's sexual experience, um, among other things. Some yeah. people say it's too sad. Too sad. To share books like that yeah. with kids. We've got violence in the outsiders again. Mm -hmm. And the pig man, is it also violence? The pig man is, is violence. Yeah. yeah. Because they end up causing, inadvertently causing his death. Right. Okay. And of course, because John swears a lot. Yeah. Um, oh, and speak, uh, I guess, it because it talks about date rape. I yeah. mean, you know, it just. Yeah. Urg. I know. So we wanted to kind of pause here for a moment. We've been talking about challenges, talking about bannings. We want to talk about the difference between censorship and selection because librarians do this on a regular basis. They have to look at something and decide, is this something that I select to add to the collection? And am I selecting it using the appropriate kind of criteria? And if you look at the most recent survey about censorship from School Library Journal, um, this is, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is my own survey. I'm sorry, uh, I have the SLJ stuff coming up. A um, couple years ago, we did a survey of 200 teachers and 200 librarians, and look at what they say. Uh, a lot of them say books should never be banned. Kids should be able to read anything. But some of them say that they favor district guidelines, 25% of librarians, but 64% of teachers. And we, if, if in within our own profession, we have people who say, well, I think it would be okay if we had guidelines. I wanna say, do those, are those district guidelines? What are they based upon? There are all kinds of kind of wiggle room in here mm -hmm. to talk about. So basically the difference between censorship and selection is censorship seeks to exclude, selection seeks to include. 
So censorship, you're wanting to take this book away from people so no one can read it. And selection, you're providing it so people can read it. So, I mean, that's just comes right down to it. That's all there is. There's a, a little dotted gray line between these two. It's mm -hmm. not really easy to have. This is censorship. Yeah. This is selection. It's not that clear cut. So as professionals, when we are thinking about do I add this to the collection? Do I recommend this for a middle school or an elementary school or a high school? We always have to keep in mind, how am I making that decision? Am I using the criteria that I should be? The development of kids. Um, the, Positive reviews. That's right. All those good things that we're ta told about. So be thinking about this. But the thing that concerns us the most is gatekeeping. Yes. Um, and this is a serious issue. And it happens a lot. Uh, so, I'm a school librarian, and I do not like wizards and uh, witches and things like that. I feel that it is dangerous to society for people to read this. And so, as my book order is coming along, I see Harry Potter is something that's everybody's really wanting to read, but I don't agree with it. So, I don't put it on my book list, and I don't order it, and I won't have it on my shelf. That's gatekeeping. That is not providing that resource for those students. So it's not been challenged, and it's not been banned in my school. But because of gatekeeping, I'm preventing that from even happening. So it's it's like the it's like preventing. It's like the first step. I'm afraid it's going to cause problems, so I don't include it, or I just don't agree with it, so I don't include it. That's gatekeeping. I really I learned this term oh, several years ago. Um, I was chairing a panel with Rosemary Chance on censorship. And uh, we had Barry Liga, Co Booth, and oh gosh, oh, Julianne Peters, uh, all of whom we thought would have experience mm -hmm. in censorship to kind of talk about it. And I asked Barry Liga a question about Boy Toy, which was his current novel mm -hmm. about a teacher who went to prison um, because she seduced and had sexual relationship with one of her middle school students. Young boy. And now she's getting out of jail and this boy has very mixed kind yeah. of feelings about it uh, because he Ooh. was a willing quote unquote participant. It gives me chills. So we get about it. We asked Barry, you know, so what if, what kind of censorship issues have you seen? And he said, none. And we just kind of sat there dumbfounded. And I, I remembered to ask why. Right. <laughs> and he said, because most libraries aren't adding it That's to the collection. Right. That's gatekeeping. There you go. It's you hear there's something, ooh, I don't know, that's going to make people uncomfortable. Uh -huh. Maybe we shouldn't even put it on the shelf. Right. That's just the wrong way to go. So if you decide not to add the book because someone has been critical of it, you're a gatekeeper. You remove the book from your shelf because it's been challenged somewhere else. That's a gatekeeper. You have to follow the policy. Mm -hmm. Or you use levels, lexiles, and other factors to restrict access to books. You're a gatekeeper. I know people aren't going to like to hear this. Yep. I really do because I know that there are lots of libraries that are leveled and lexiled to death. But when you tell a third grader you can't have that book because it's not in your level, or you tell a ninth grader you can't read that, it's too easy, you really are limiting what they can read. And anytime we limit what you can read, I think we're being gatekeepers mm -hmm. of sorts. Okay, so we're going to go through really quick, because actually we're kind of running out of time with uh -huh. what we have. So we're going to just go through our, our favorite band books. We're not going to do major book talks. We're just going to let you know what our favorite books are. And these books are all on the band and challenge They list. are! We didn't have any trouble at no. all. Uh, so I'll just start with the book that will always be in my young adult literature course. Um, I read it when I took young adult literature. The book is 1974's The Chocolate War by Bob Cormier. Uh, when he um, gave the book to his editor, um, he was told, because he had been writing adult books, he said, uh, they said, Bob, this is a book for young adults. And he didn't even know. He just said, is that a good thing or a bad <laughs> thing? Uh, and it has gone on to be on that banned book list mm -hmm. every single year. If you have not read it, it is an incredible piece of literature. And you should read it just for that reason. My One of my favorites is The Hunger Games, of course. Mm -hmm. Guess what's number one this year on the most challenged books of 2015? It's Looking for Alaska, The Prince Winner, and John Green's first novel. Crank, 
um, is on the list and, of, and ch challenged um, often. And my personal experience, which I'm not going to go into a lot, is glass. I had glass challenged at my middle school, and it went through the entire process. Um, it had news stories. It was huge. She was uninvited from my school. Um, I had to find somewhere else for her to speak. Um, at the end of it, um, I was able to keep the book on my shelf because the committee voted in the book's favor. Yay! Yep. And by the way, disinviting authors, that's, that's a big problematic deal. Yes, too. Yes, and it happens quite a bit. There's The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian yep. by Sherman Alexie, Excellent. National Book Award winner, and yet it's on the band challenge mm -hmm. list. Chris Crutcher's Whale Ugh. Talk. Absolutely love this book, but it is frequently challenged, as is a lot of Crutcher's. Uh, yeah, Crutcher, Crutcher Language, is, is up you know, there. Yeah. So is Judy Bloom. There yep. are some people that just, they yeah. write and it goes on the list. Uh, I loved Two Boys Kissing by David Levithan, but of course, mm -hmm. you put a picture of two boys kissing on the cover, and you're going to have a lot of people who are either gatekeeping or just flat out challenging the That's book right. because of that reason. Eleanor and Park uh, is frequently challenged in districts. She has been uninvited to a school because of this book. Captain Underpants, I just put, yep. I didn't, you don't have to put a particular title. It's anything Captain Underpants, anything George and Harold. I'm pretty sure that the new Dogman series will end up there as well. Winter Girls. Uh, um, it was challenged due to the fact that people complained saying that it was basically a guidebook on how girls could starve themselves and be anorexic. Yeah, which really made which Lori Holtz Anderson right. crazy. Uh, Harry Potter, of course. one through seven. It's a book because how dare he say jackass. Jackass. It's a book, jackass. Uh, Daddy's Roommate was probably the one that, that started a whole bunch of fury back when it was first published. I actually put it on my children's literature reading list when it hit. Um, it was on a supplementary multicultural list in the New York schools, and somebody went, Daddy's Roommate, and checked it, checked it out. It's from a very small press, and read it, and I mean book sales skyrocketed and I bought 10 copies and donated them to all kinds of places. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the first book that really acknowledges daddy uh, is wonderful. I love living with daddy. Daddy has a new roommate and they uh, work together. We play together. We party together and they sleep together. Oh my goodness. That was, that's it. The uh, giver. Absolutely wonderful book, but it is frequently challenged. This was also challenged in my district. All of the scary stories to tell in the dark, which I loved reading mm -hmm. aloud to my students because, of course, they are scary and we don't want to scare kids. Mm -hmm. Blood <sighs> Chocolate. I love this book. Mm -hmm. It's a werewolf, but it says it's been challenged due to expli sexually explicit scenes. But I tell you, for the life of me, I really can't pick that out. I can't remember out. either, so I, I, must, I must have missed the dirty parts. Yeah, Dog me too. It. I'm going to have to go back and find them. And this is required reading yep. in my class. I use uh, It's Perfectly Normal and It's So, so Amazing. amazing. Uh, basically, we just call them the sex books. Six and that should tell you they're great. that tells you why it's there. So the process that we use should be easy. We have a policy mm -hmm. we seek to include, and we want to make sure that our products are diverse. And this year's Banned Book Weeks theme talks extensively about uh, books that are diverse in content because they are starting to move up, up, and up, and up in that banned book list every year. This is the most recent graphic. Um, on the diversity in children's books um, statistics. And I think we'll probably talk about this in a future broadcast. Yeah. Okay, and so that's Banned Books Weeks for us. Um, if you have comments, please put them in the comments underneath the video. Tweet them, Facebook them, whatever. Um, subscribe and and let us. us and let us know what you want us to talk about yeah. because we're open to all kinds of different topics. We want to provide professional development for you, not just for our own students. So we'll see you next week, everybody.